front. I uh, want to remind everyone that we do have brunch after service today, so please join us for that. I'm looking forward to that. I just had a bowl of cereal this morning to make sure I'd be good and ready uh, for that. My appetite's, you know, wet for it. So uh, there's that. And then, of course, after our brunch day, what we'd like to do is spend a little bit of time talking about the potential of putting in a digital sign out front. So we've been doing quite a little bit of research on that, looking at the cost and looking at different uh, people that we could use as, as a vendor for that. So we're going to talk a little bit about that at brunch too, so we'd love your thoughts and opinions on that. And then also to this Wednesday evening, ladies are getting together here at the church 7 p.m. So those are your announcements this morning. Before we go into worship, though, I would like to have us do the Lord's Prayer together. So if you would, let's stand. And let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
All right, please be seated. Thank you, Janet. Before we get into communion, I'd like to take an opportunity to pray as a church. First, I'd like to ask if anybody has any prayer requests or they want to give the Lord praise for what he's done this week. We've got a mic that's going to be passed around so people listening and watching online can hear you. Okay? Yes, I have a praise. I thank the Lord for a wonderful week traveling with friends and family. Um, Also, Val called me this morning, and she said that they have an emergency with her mom. And so I'm sure that they could use the prayers. Thank you. All right. Many of you, I'm sure, are wondering about Pete. I've actually had some of you come up to me and ask, how is he doing? I'd sent out a prayer uh, chain request through the call multiplier earlier this week for Amber's grandfather, Pete. I do have a positive report to share with all of you. Uh, X-rays show some slight improvement. Uh, There are... Many days still needed for him to make progress, but they did want to stress that he is headed in the right direction, and that yesterday, we as a family, and I'm talking Amber's dad, his siblings, all of Amber's siblings, kids, we got a chance to go out there and stand in the parking lot, and they brought Pete to the window, and so they got to see us out there and we got a phone call in and put it on speakerphone. People got to tell them that we love them. We prayed for them. And I think that was incredibly encouraging. And so we thank you all for praying for Pete and continue to ask that you'd pray for him. We know that this is something that our church has faced in some pretty heavy ways. And the outcome is not always favorable. And we know that worldwide. And so we're asking that we would just continue not just to pray for Pete, but for many in this same situation, and that God's will would be done, and that God would heal many. So thankful for that. want to just share that with you about Pete. We'll lift him up together. And then also want to lift up my parents' church back in Washington State. Uh, They faced a tremendous tragedy this week. Uh, There was a family member, 24 years old, driving in a car, and was in a car accident, and didn't make it, 24, and we want to lift him up, um, lift the family up, and we just want to just come alongside our brothers and sisters in the Lord thousands of miles away, so let's pray for that family, I'm just going to leave it as just the church family in Washington, so we'll pray for them as well, so if you would join me in prayer, let's bow our heads now, let's take all of this to God, God, we are in need of you. God, when we hear of things like the tragedy in Washington State and what that family is facing right now and the loss of that, that young life, God, we, I, I find myself at least at a loss for words. And we talked about it in Sunday school last week. Sometimes we go to you in prayer and we don't know what to say. And that's okay. God, you Through your Holy Spirit, you speak to us, you provide us with peace and comfort, and God, you remind us that you are ultimately in control, and that you will continue to bring peace and hope into this situation and into those family members' lives who love that boy. And we're asking, God, you would be with that church family, and especially that family who lost that young man in a very special way. And God, we are asking that you would continue to be with Pete, that you would just give him the strong immune system that he needs to fight this infection in his lungs, and that he, God, would just continue to get better. We pray for that same outcome for many who are facing COVID and then the onslaught of of pneumonia that seems to follow. God, we are praying for that. We're asking that you would heal and that you would move in power. 
And we're praying, God, that you'd comfort families who have not had the outcome that they were hoping for and that you would remind them that you are there, that you are sovereign, that you love them, and that, God, you want that relationship with them all the same and to, tr- and to have them trust in you all the same, even when things are difficult and hard to understand. And, God, we're thankful for, for weeks like Kay said she had. We are thankful for those highs in our life. Those wonderful weeks, God, with family and friends, when the weather seems to be nice, everything just seems to be going well, we're thankful for those times. And God, we pray for Val. Whatever the emergency is, whatever the situation is with mom, God, we are praying that you would move in the exact ways that they need. We're asking that you would remind us to continue to pray for her and for others in our church with needs. Lord, we love you and we lift these things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so right now, we are going to prepare for communion. I'm going to ask you guys, just as the uh, folks come forward that will be preparing the uh, communion elements, that we would just take time right now and reflect on what this practice is for. Communion is a beautiful time, isn't it? It's a time to be reminded of what God did the promises that God fulfilled, and the fact that the God we serve keeps his word, right? God is a man of his word, so to speak, isn't he? He keeps his word, and we are thankful for that. And we're thankful for what Jesus has done. Without Jesus' you know, sacrifice on the cross, we'd all be in a world of trouble. Without Jesus rising from the dead, all of this would be meaningless, Paul says, right, in Corinthians. We are thankful for what Jesus did on the cross, for that atoning sacrifice, and of course, for the resurrection. So, bear that in mind, and also examine yourself. I'm going to examine myself, so I'm going to give us a second. Jen, if you just play some, some music without words, um, and just give us a chance to reflect. Take a moment to reflect on what God's doing in your life where maybe you need to have him address some things. Let's take a moment together.
ladies are awesome. You got one, Margie? Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do now is take the communion together. I'm going to read a few verses here from 1 Corinthians. Paul says here, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Please take the bread, break it, and receive it. Be careful if you haven't already opened your little cup. It can get, can get a little burpy there, so watch it there. Verse 25, Paul says, in the same way. Think about what Paul's saying here. Just as we have received the bread to remind us of Jesus' broken body, we need to be reminded of the blood that was shed. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. That's what God has instituted. That's what God has said. And so we are thankful. Verse 25, in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant, right? The new agreement in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's receive. Paul says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Praise God, you guys, for what God has done and what he is doing in our lives. I'm so thankful. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Janet. Here, I got you, too. Got it. Oh, they took it off. All right. Always good to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Always good to be reminded of what God did and what he's continuing to do in our lives. I'm thankful. Thankful for those reminders. Those are good, tangible reminders of what God has done and is doing in our lives. All right. So we are headed now to Mark's Gospel. And... We've been in Mark's gospel for a little while now, and we've been studying through Mark's gospel, and we've been describing it as just a portrait of Jesus. This is one picture of Jesus, one very three-dimensional, in-depth portrait of Jesus. And a while back, I mean, when we got started with Mark's gospel, I stated that Mark's gospel was certainly written to be read but more than that, it was, it was written to be orally presented. In fact, one of my New Testament books in seminary had many professors in it stating, and scholars stating in this book, that they feel like Mark's gospel, based on its quick pace, its uh, similarities to Greek theater, that it was certainly meant to be orally presented, right? Right? It was intended to be dramatic narrative. 
In addition, I've also said that many scholars have noted that Mark's style of writing is often used in a unique way, and, and other gospel writers did this, and other you know, writers in the Bible did this, but Mark certainly is known for his sandwiching technique. It's just this literary feature to help draw out points in his gospel. In fact, we looked at three examples last week. Really, three examples of this sandwiching technique. Three times Jesus predicted his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. There's our bread, right? Remember we talk about a sandwich, you've got to have some bread of some sort. Even if you're, you know, gluten-free or whatever, you've got to have some lettuce as your, as your bread, something, right? So there, our first piece of bread in our sandwich is what? Jesus predicting his suffering, death, resurrection, there's the first piece. Then the feeling is, how did Jesus' disciples respond? Three different times when Jesus said, I'm going to suffer, die, and rise from the dead, the disciples responded with not understanding it. And in fact, they continued to look for ways to promote themselves and to be prideful. That's your feeling of the sandwich three different times. And then we see Jesus responds. Here's our another piece of bread. Three different times, very patiently, with more teaching on the importance of serving others and being humble. Now, we talked about humility last week. We talked about what the Bible says humility should look like. Remember, biblical humility is not a call to be weak. It's not a call to be a doormat. Rather, biblical humility is first and foremost about recognizing our need for God. That's going to be all over the place in our message today as I draw out certain points. Jesus, right? Think about Jesus. He's God in the flesh. Has there ever been someone more powerful than Jesus here on this earth? I mean, think about that. There never was someone more powerful than Jesus before Jesus, and there's never going to be anyone more powerful after Jesus than Jesus. But how did Jesus use his power? How did he use his strength? How did he use his influence? In ways to help others, in ways to serve others, right? To teach in powerful ways, to do miracles that were, you know, helpful and, and beneficial in people's lives. Last week we looked at, Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And we are to follow in Jesus' footsteps. So today, we're going to be going through Mark 11, verses 12 through 26, and we're going to see Mark once again utilizing that sandwiching technique to drive home his Holy Spirit-inspired points and to accentuate the drama of his gospel narrative. In particular, we're going to see how Jesus was and is looking for people to exercise faith and produce fruit. We've talked about producing fruit here as a church, haven't we? When we talk about producing fruit, that's just a vivid way, an expressive way to say, hey, what are the actions of your lives producing? Good things, bad things, right? We all produce fruit. It's either good fruit, tasty fruit, or fruit that's gone bad, right? And that's what the Bible says. We are supposed to produce good fruit. And so, this morning, we're going to look at how Jesus taught and showed quite dramatically that God deeply desires for us to trust in him, to cooperate with him so that we can produce good fruit. This is going to come out of the following passages that Mark intentionally sandwiches. First, let me put you, let me just, hey, Isaac, Isaac, look at this picture, buddy. Oh, how much you love peanut butter and jelly, buddy. Yeah, he's my PB&J man. So when we think about sandwiching, there's where we're headed today. All right, our bread today, our first piece of bread is Jesus basically curses this fig tree. All right, there's your first piece of bread. The filling, our peanut butter and jelly, is Jesus going into the temple and clearing it out. And then the other piece of bread is the lesson on why did Jesus wither this fig tree? That's where we're headed. And we're going to find out in Jesus' explanation of the withered tree, that it relates to producing good fruit. 
and having faith in God, which Jesus says in this lesson is necessary for a powerful prayer life. One more time. In order to produce good fruit, we got to have faith in God. And in order to have a fruitful life, we must have a powerful prayer life. That's what we're going to look at this morning. That's where we're headed in these verses. Okay, one more point that I think is worth mentioning here is that we have been doing a consecutive walk through Mark's gospel for the most part, other than when we stopped for Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. So we already looked at verses 1 through 11 in Mark 11. That's why we're not going through those today. So if you missed that teaching, go to ShabonaRiversideChurch.com, click on the media page, and you will find that teaching. So the point, though, that is, I think, necessary is from Mark 11 on to the end, we are dealing with Jesus' last week of ministry. Right? Mark 1 of verse, Mark 1 through 11 of Mark 11. So we're talking about the chapter of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. That was Palm Sunday. So we are now well into Jesus' final week of ministry, which means everything is heightened. Everything is more intense, and that's important to keep in mind as we jump into these verses. So we're going to read through these verses. I'm going to talk about them as we go along. So let's look at it together. This is where we ended Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11 on Palm Sunday. We ended with, I underlined it for you all there, right? Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. That's where we ended on Palm Sunday. Now we're back into Mark 11. This is a new day. This is Monday of Holy Week, if you will. Verse 12, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. All right, I want us to look at verses 12 through 14 now together. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again, and his disciples heard him say it. Why Jesus curses the fig tree is going to make more sense when we look at verses uh, down the road here in our study this morning. However, there is one verse I want us to narrow in on. I think it's easier here because it's the one right here at the bottom. I know it was on the slide before, but it's easier to focus on it here because it's the verse that's not underlined. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. By the way, everyone, two things. We are in our first piece of bread, right? We're looking at Mark's sandwich technique. Our first piece of bread is Jesus going to the fig tree, seeing that there's no fruit, and he curses it. Now, there's something I want us to draw our attention to. It says Jesus was hungry. Certainly, Jesus felt physical hunger, right? He did but I think there's a literary clue going on here for all of us. Jesus, God in the flesh, is hungry for what? Hungry for you and I, for his people, to trust in him and be fruitful. We're going to see that come out today. So I think there's a clue here that God is wanting to see faithfulness and fruitfulness in his people. He's hungry for that. God is hungry to see faithfulness and fruitfulness in his people. Let's look at the following verses. Here's the PB&J, you guys. Here's the filling in the sandwich. This is right after cursing the fig tree. Verse 15, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called the house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers." Pretty intense, huh? Check out this. Uh, this is one artist's depiction of Jesus clearing 
the temple. You see that there? This is by 19th century Danish painter Karl Bloch. And that's his depiction. It looks like Jesus kind of has a halo behind him. Now, this story of Jesus clearing the temple is found in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke put it in the final week of Jesus' ministry. John puts it at the beginning of his Gospel. So it makes people wonder, were there two different times that Jesus cleared the temple? More than likely... John, whose gospel was the last to be written, he knew Matthew, Mark, and Luke were circulating. People knew the story. He put it in the front to make a theological point. Jesus was coming to clear things out because God was doing something new. Just something to keep in mind there. Now, I love this rhetorical question, verse 17. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called the house of prayer for all nations? Is it not written? Love that memorable rhetorical question. Now, when Jesus raises this rhetorical question and continues to clear out the temple courts, it leads a response, or I guess it, brings a response to the religious leaders in a pretty intense way. Check out the response of the religious leaders. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. You guys, this is not the first time that the... I should put it this way, that some of the religious leaders had determined to kill Jesus or plotted to kill Jesus. This is not the first time it's recorded in Mark's gospel that the religious leaders were plotting after Jesus did something to kill Jesus. But why are they so, why are they so disturbed now? What do you think the deal is? Remember what happened The day before, Jesus came riding in on a donkey. You got literally the largest crowds that Jesus has ever gathered going behind him, in front of him, coming together, and they're crying out that Jesus is the Messiah. Clearly, the religious leaders, some of them, were feeling like their power and their influence was being threatened. And now the next day, Jesus comes into the temple and just starts overturning tables and, and, you know, pushing the money changers out. Wow. Wow. Yes, this is causing them to be like, we are losing control here. In fact, it makes me think of this comparison. You guys ready for this? Where are my kids? Kids, you ready for this? This is the slide. I told you it was coming. All right, you ready? Here you go. This clearing of the temple courts made me think of Winnie the Pooh. And you're thinking, what on earth are you talking about? Well... The clearing of the temple was kind of like the final straw for the religious leaders. And we see here the response was, we're going to plot how we can kill Jesus. Not the first time, right? In this scene of Winnie the Pooh, this is a scene of the blustery day. And I want you, I know, I've got five kids, so this is the kind of comparison that comes into my brain. All right? So we got Winnie the Pooh here. Now, each of these Things in this picture represent something. I want you to think of Piglet. Piglet is representing a certain Jewish tradition or some certain Jewish traditions that were weighing down Israel. And the mindset and system that was keeping people, both Jews and non-Jews, from truly growing closer to God. So Piglet is that. Piglet represents a system that was weighing down the people of Israel and non-Jews, and keeping them from growing closer to God. Certain systems, certain traditions. Poo, you guys, who is Poo here? Poo is the religious leaders, some of them. Not all of them, we know from the scripture, some of them believed in Jesus. But Poo represents those who disagree or oppose Jesus. And the wind, the wind represents God, and what God was doing through Jesus. And the wind is blowing away the old system and mindset and traditions that didn't capture the heart of God. Now here's the idea. They are getting 
out of control. In fact, the next slide here, we see, look, the religious leaders are trying to hold on to their old system, the old way of doing things, the traditions that didn't capture the heart of God. And look at, even Pooh's smiling right now. They've got it, man. We're in control. Everything's okay. But we find here that that's not the case by the time we get to Jesus' final week of ministry. The religious leaders, for the most part, are realizing that their power and their influence is not there anymore. It's unraveling. They have lost control. In fact, in John's gospel, just after Jesus enters into Jerusalem and we see Palm Sunday play out in John's gospel, this is what the religious leaders say. So the, some of them. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look at how the whole world has gone after him. At this point, you guys, this is the situation. You guys see that? At this point, there are, there's Pooh. Pooh represents some of the religious leaders. They're trying to hold on to their traditions and their old system of doing things. And the wind is God, and God's moving through Jesus and saying, I'm changing things completely in some ways. Some things will never be the same again for my people, Israel. And the old system is unraveling. The traditions are unraveling. Piglet represents that old tradition, and they have totally lost control at this point. All right. So there's my little comparison there. Now, they're feeling, some of the religious leaders, that there is this feeling of desperation in their minds. It's painfully apparent that they are no longer in control. That is why they say here again, 18, 19, the chief priests, the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And Jesus leaves that night. Now, let's talk for a minute, before I move on, let's talk for a minute about the two events that seem out of character for Jesus. We see Jesus destroy life, albeit plant life, right? It was a plant. But nevertheless, his miracle was destructive in nature. That's out of character for Jesus. And then we see right after that, Jesus enters the temple courts in in the Jerusalem temple, and he clears the money changers and the, the people buying and selling, he clears them out and he's overturning tables. Very uncharacteristic of Jesus once again. Back to back, uncharacteristic events in the Gospels. I want to look at the second situation first. Okay, I want to look at our peanut butter and jelly a little bit more. Let me take you to this slide. So everyone, I want to make sure you're all tracking here, okay? Here's where we're at with things. We're in the middle. Our first piece of bread, Jesus curses the fig tree, right? Mark 11, 12 through 14. Now we're going to be talking about the filling. We're going to be talking first about the filling, then we're going to explain why Jesus cursed the fig tree. So the filling, Jesus cleanses the temple, out of character for Jesus. Why did he do it? We know it's connected here. Mark's making a point here with his sandwiching technique, but let's talk about why did Jesus clear the temple? Obviously, uh, anger is not always a sin, right? Anger is not always a sin, right? I hope you know that. Anger can be, a, can be righteous. It can be a righteous anger. In fact, Ephesians says, be angry and do not sin. Ephesians teaches that. Be angry and do not sin. Of course, no one gets that right all the time. Anybody get that right all the time? Who here, who here gets that verse, be angry and do not sin, right all the time? Yeah, I definitely do not. And so we see here, though, that it reminds us that anger can be an emotion that is righteous, that is good. And God gets it right every time, all the time. And so we see when Jesus cleared the temple courts, his anger was justified. Let me ask you this question. You may just caught what I said. Where did these people set up shop to sell the required animals for the sacrifices? Where did Jesus clear them out of. Let me take you back there. 
One more slide back, I think. It says in verse 16, And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. What's the temple courts? And what was the purpose of the temple courts? Here's the significance. The temple courts was the only space that Jews allowed non-Jewish people to enter. I'm going I'm to walk down here with my notes. I'm getting in my steps, I guess. You guys are going to track with me here. The temple courts. It was the only space that Jews allowed non-Jewish people to enter. This is the spot, you guys, where non-Jews could go in and engage in dialogue with Jewish teachers, with religious leaders. It was the only place where non-Jews could go and learn about God and pray. This is the only place. And it had been overtaken by merchants. And apparently some of them were robbers. So, this is the space, this is the place where the Jews had set up the money changers. Albeit not all of them, right? It's really easy, you guys, to make it seem that all Jewish leaders were not, were not doing what God's will was. That's not true. And I want to make sure we catch that. As I teach this, I want to make sure that I'm making it clear. Some of the Jewish leaders, some of the religious leaders, were not opposed to Jesus. But many were. And we see here, Jesus enters the temple courts. This is the only place, you guys, where non-Jewish people could go and learn about God and understand what God's will is for their life, to engage in dialogue with the religious leaders, to actually pray and grow in their faith. And where were the money changers? Where were the, all the animals put for the necessary sacrifices? In the very spot where non-Jewish people could go. That's why Jesus cleared the temple. That's why Jesus was indignant with what was going on in the temple courts. Basically, they had filled it with the money change. They should have put it somewhere else is what Jesus was saying. Remember, his response was, my house is a house of prayer for what? All nations, not just the Jewish nation. So Jesus is showing that God's anger is justified because God welcomes all people to learn about him, to grow in their faith, and to be able to be in a place where they can pray and be connected to God. That's why Jesus cleared out the temple courts. It's important we understand why Jesus did that. So with that, Well, let's go back to the fig tree, right? Our fig tree. This is going to lead into the final discussion, the other piece of bread of the fig tree. But when Jesus cleared the temple, because clearly I keep telling us here, let me go back to our little image here, all right? I keep telling us we got this image, we got this sandwich, and we see here that Jesus has just cleared the temple courts. He's frustrated that some of the Jewish leaders had filled this place where the non-Jews could go and learn about God with this area to exchange uh, their money, to get the sacrifices that were required for the Passover and all that. And he said, not good, right? So implicitly, what are we being told here? And we understand that in light of the sandwich technique. God was frustrated that the religious leaders were not being faithful to God and they were not living their lives in such a way that were fruitful themselves and allowing other people to become more fruitful. God is very interested in the fruit that we bear. Right? In fact, James, the book of James talks about this it talks, James talks about how our faith and our deeds should match up. And the religious leaders were talking the talk, but they weren't walking the walk in everything that God wanted them to be doing. All right, so now let's move to our other section here. 
So Mark split this on purpose. We see here now, in the morning, now we're in the following day. We've just passed Monday. We're now on to Tuesday. And now Jesus gives a lesson on why he cursed the fig tree. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said, Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. This is the other piece of bread, right? The withered fig tree. Now we're going to be talking about why did he do this. It's to drive home the point. Like I was saying that we need, we need to be fruitful, Christians. God was looking for his people, Israel, in particular Israel's leaders, to be faithful and fruitful, right? To live their lives in ways that were good. Live their lives in ways that God was pleased with. And they weren't many of them. And so the fig tree was cursed. It was withered. It was meant to represent what was going on and what was going to happen. You see, God was saying, listen, if you're not fruitful, if you're not faithful, you will be basically finding yourselves set up on a shelf and no longer being used by God. I remember Chuck Smith great pastor out in California saying that. And it's, to me, very sobering. If we find ourselves being unfaithful, which then would create us to be unfruitful, we will be essentially set up on a shelf and unuseful to God. And that's what had happened. And Jesus says, I'm gonna curse this fig tree and it's going to be this very tangible parable for you guys to realize what many of the Jewish leaders are doing is wrong. And this is going to cause their work and their purpose to no longer be useful. Now, of course, we know that from the Old Testament, everything was meant to be temporary until Jesus came. But what they were being told was that their usefulness was completely being dried up because they weren't accepting what Jesus was coming to prepare all of the nation of Israel, as well as all the nations in the world, to receive and to understand. Now, let's think about this. In this light, Israel's leaders had lost sight of their primary purpose of helping both Israel and non-Jewish people grow in their faith. Their influence, their purpose was drying up and withering away. Now let's think about how is the Bible relevant to our lives? How does this matter for us today? How does this matter? Well, it certainly, I think, is a sobering reminder for pastors, for church leaders, for people who hold offices in the church. But it's also important for every single person who's influential in the church, whether they have a title or not. And guess what? That means all of us, right? Yes, it certainly is a sobering reminder for those with official church leadership titles, but we all have influence, right? John Maxwell, leadership guru, you know what he says about leadership? He says, leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. And so when we see here, when we apply that thinking, then it's fair to say every person in the church has some level of influence. And are we, church, how are we, maybe I should put it this way, how are we using our influence? And let me just say it right now, I'm proud of this church. Sometimes I think when a preacher preaches, people are like, man, he's drilling me. He's, dr he's drilling this church. He's drilling us. You know what? I'm proud of this church because you know what I've heard in my short time of being with all of you is we're willing to do wherever, whatever and we're willing to go wherever God directs us. We're willing to do what God is calling us to do. We will lay aside traditions. We will accept change even though we know it will be hard, because we recognize that we want to do what God is calling this church to do. I have seen that. Sometimes it's not articulated. Sometimes it's just the posture many of you carry. But you guys are open to this. And that's what God is saying. He wants to see. What was the temple for, you guys? The temple was this temporary place that God had set up so people could go and learn about God. Are we 
church? Yes, I would say Shabona is. So this is a question we are calling churches everywhere. Churches, we need to keep the temple courts open, so to speak, don't we? We need to make sure that there is a seat ready for anyone who comes in from the outside, that they are welcomed where they can learn about God, grow in their faith, and learn more about what it is like to follow Jesus. That's the call. That's how it's relevant today. It was a time in Israel's history where Jesus was coming and saying, change is ready. Change is ripe change is necessary and certain religious leaders buck that change and when we as a church continue to say God direct us lead us where you want us to go we will be faithful we want to see the temple courts open for whoever comes in our church and of course churches all over so that God's will can be done and people can grow in their faith and be fruitful that's what we want to see so let's close with some final thoughts Let me look at Mark. Let me just, let me give you this quote. I love this quote by John Stott. Uh, John Stott was a theologian, pastor, well-known in the last century in particular for his commitment to the church and evangelism. John Stott says this, the authority by which the Christian leader leads is not power, but love, not force, but example. Not coercion, but reasoned persuasion. Leaders have power, but power is safe only in the hands of those who humble themselves to serve. Remember, I want to make this connection as clear as I can. Jesus was cursing the fig tree, and the fig tree primarily represented the Jewish leaders that didn't understand that God said it was time for change. That God was doing something new. And Jesus came, as we celebrated communion this morning, God was starting to establish a new covenant with his people and all the people in the world that would believe. And certain Jewish leaders did not want to accept that change. And God said, through Jesus, in this teaching of this parable of the fig tree being uh, withered, your time is drying up. You will no longer be useful because you're not accepting what I'm coming to do through my son. We as a church today, we want to, as a church, fulfill God's purposes for the church. And that is our call to be that faithful, fruitful church. That's the connection. We want to be fruitful and faithful. All right? And so when we look at Mark eleven twenty-two, 22, what is the answer? Because you guys might be thinking, this is all well and good, Dan, and you're preaching this message, but what do I do and how do I apply it? The answer is in... Verse 22, right here. Jesus answered, and I put it in King James for you guys. You like that? I know a lot of you guys like your King James. So I put this one verse in King James for you. Jesus says, unto the, he says, Jesus answered and saith unto them, have faith in God. What is, the, what is the response of the church? If we don't want to wither and dry up, if we don't want to be put up on a shelf and not be useful to God, what's the answer? The answer, Jesus says, is faith. That's the primary answer. We need to have faith in God. That is what we need to apply. And so Jesus goes on to teach us this. Verse 23, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Goes on to say here, Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. All right, so some final thoughts here. Two final thoughts as we close our time together on what Jesus just said. Uh, First thought. Let's go to verse 24. Yep. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. I want to make sure we don't take that passage and twist it in such a way where it's saying, well, whatever I pray for, if it's done in faith, then God's going to grant it to me. Because guess what? That doesn't even make sense if we actually think about it. That's not, Jesus is just essentially saying, pray. Pray faithfully and believe God's going to do what God's going to do. 
Because here's why. If you had, and this is not my thinking, uh, one Christian theologian presented it like this. If you had faith enough and prayed, God, would you make me God? If I have faith enough, if I take this verse just as what it says and I believe hard enough, God, make me God, is God going to make you God? So we can't take this verse and say, oh yeah, if I believe it strong enough and hard enough, God's going to do it. What if we believe, this is also from Geisler, what if we believe, God, I want you to look at the sin in my life and no longer look at it as sin and I want you to bless me because I have the faith for it and I believe it. You see, there are certain restrictions that God operates in still, even though he's God. And so we can't take this verse and be like, well, that's just telling me that if I pray hard enough, I'll get what I want, whatever I want. And that also helps us to know that if something happens that we pray for and it's not what we were praying for, it doesn't necessarily mean we lacked faith. Because I've heard that. I've even heard someone tell me that, that I've lacked faith. And that's the reason why I didn't get fill in the blank. We got to be careful with that. That doesn't necessarily mean that either. We are just told we are to respond to God in faith and to be faithful in prayer. Remember Paul? Good old Paul the Apostle? He's a pretty faithful guy, wasn't he? Three times Paul asked for this pain to go away. He called it his thorn in his flesh, and it never did go away. So we can't say, well, Paul just didn't have faith enough. Certainly Paul had faith. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers, right? And it doesn't mean we lack faith. And it doesn't mean, like I said, that when we pray, God's going to just grant us whatever we ask for just because we believe in hard enough. I like the way Geisler, who I've been uh, quoting here recently and referencing, put it. Prayer is not a means by which God serves us. Rather, it is a means by which we serve God. And I would add prayer is this essential means to which we genuinely connect with him and build a sincere relationship with him. Which leads to my second point. You guys ready? Almost done here. Number two, a critical way godly, influential Christians develop a rock-solid faith is through a healthy prayer life. I think that's what Jesus is getting at here. He says, have faith in God. How do we as a church Go and be the church that God wants us to be in this community. We have faith. How do we exercise our faith? By prayer. Many of you know this. When you lift weights, right? When you lift weights, what happens to your muscles? Oh, hey, oh, buddy. So what happens to our muscles? What happens to our muscles when we lift weights? Little, little tears, right? Little tears in our muscle fibers actually happen. But the response of our muscles is what? Because of that activity, the muscles get what? Stronger, bigger. That's the idea of prayer. When we go to God and we pray, guess what our prayer life does? It tears down the thinking that we're the ones ultimately in control. It reminds us of who is ultimately in control. It breaks down that self-centered thinking It reminds us to think outside of our own world. It builds up our faith. It builds up the faith of others. That's what prayer does. And that's why Jesus is saying, church, you need to pray. What is the response of a healthy church? In this case, what is the response of each individual that makes up the church? All of us have a level of influence in the church. And to be faithful, influential Christians in the church to not be set up on a shelf and be deemed unuseful, the response is have faith. Have faith and pray a lot and believe that God is going to do what he's gonna do. Remember, we go to God and we say, we trust that you know best. And in your sovereignty, we are going to come to you honestly about our desires and then rest in your sovereignty. Let's pray. Would you bow your heads with me? God, we just ask that you would remind us of those two truths. As we walk out of here and into kind of the uh, busyness of life and we get to our kind of day-to-day activities and our brain gets just inundated with a number of other things, Lord, help us to remember, keep it at the forefront of our minds, we are to walk in faith, that we are to be fruitful Christians, 
that help others to see that, God, we are here to serve, that we are here to help people understand that there is a place for them in our church. And we pray that this is the same desire for churches all over the world, that people would see Christians as that connection to, hey, I want to come into your temple courts. I want to come and engage with you, and I want to come and learn about God and grow in faith. Help us, God, to be fruitful in those ways. And we ask, God, that you would bless our time. We pray, Lord, that you'd bless our fellowship, and we ask you, God, to just bless this congregation. And those watching online, bless them as well, Jesus. We love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you guys for being here this morning. Looking forward to your time uh, together and looking forward to being a part of that fellowship. So and looking forward to just connecting over brunch.